too, with variable amounts of cloud and light winds. Temperatures will remain around 15 to 16 Celsius. Much of the UK will stay dry into the early hours of Sunday morning, with plenty of clear spells around. And that's how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m.? Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening. Welcome along to Neil Oliver Live on GB News TV and on radio. On tonight's show, in company with my guests, Lord Taylor of Warwick and Tom Buick. Corruption in politics on both sides of the Atlantic remains a major talking point. What can be done to improve the situation? I'll be talking to the writer and podcaster Yaron Brook, who is an expert on the American political scene. This week's Great Britain is Mike Turlin, who rebuilt his own life and now, as the Bentley man, has helped many other people who are struggling with their mental health. Railway historian Tim Dunn and the London Transport Museum's Sidney Holloway will be here to discuss their TV series, Secrets of the London Underground. All of that and more coming up, but first, here are the latest news headlines with Bethany. Thanks, Neil. Good afternoon. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. The Conservative Party has lost nearly 500 council seats in England, Scotland and Wales in the local elections, with Labour and the Lib Dems and the Green Party making significant gains. In Scotland, the SNP remains the largest party, whilst in Wales, Plaid Cymru gained three councils. Conservative MP for Stockton South, Matt Vickers, feels positive about the Conservatives' results. It wasn't a bad night at all, really. Um, it, it wasn't great, but you know what? In context, uh, in fact, look back to Ed Miliband's time when he was in office in this same situation. He took 800 seats and we know how successful he was when it came to a general election. Yes, yeah, a tough night, but you know what? Universally across the country, it's a mixed message. The Mayor of London says Labour has had historic results in the capital with three key Tory councils, Barnet, Westminster and Swansworth, all swinging their way. 
what Keir Starmer has shown by his leadership is we're credible again. Uh, we've had people who never voted Labour before, uh, people who have been Conservative in the last election voting Labour, and that bodes well for whatever the next uh, general election is going to come. Uh, none of us believe this mission accomplished, but this is a turning point. Former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Vince Cable, told GB News his party made gains because the government has become unpopular due to Partygate and the cost of living crisis. In the areas where we're facing the Conservative Party, we've, we've done exceptionally well in the south of England, but as in, in your part of the country, uh, up north, we, we've done well in Hull and we've taken uh, also in places like Barnsley and uh, Sunderland, where you had uninspiring Labour councils, we've cut through there too. Um, and clearly the government was unpopular and that was a factor, but you know, we do pride ourselves on being active in local government. And in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon says she's thrilled at the record SNP local election result. It doesn't come easy. We don't take these results for granted. We win elections because we work hard, not just at elections, but between elections to provide good leadership and good governance for Scotland. Meanwhile, counting continues in Northern Ireland with Sinn Féin poised for a major victory. The party currently has 29% of the vote and the DUP are second with 21%. But GB News' political editor Darren McCaffrey says the DUP isn't keen on a coalition with Sinn Féin until the British government fix the Northern Ireland protocol. Sinn Féin are describing today is a defining moment for change that it is ushered in a new era here in Northern Ireland as for the first time they have topped the poll, the first time a nationalist party has topped the poll here in Northern Ireland throughout its 101 year history. It comes as the DUP, the main unionist party, saw its vote uh, fall quite substantially as the unionist vote was split among many different uh, parties. In other news, Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister says all women, children and elderly people have been evacuated from the Mariupol Azovstal steelworks. It follows Ukraine's military, saying Russia had continued its assault on the plant with the help of tanks and artillery fire. Russian missile strikes have also hit the southern port city of Odessa. UK intelligence has said the war is taking a heavy toll on Russian units and that sanctions mean it'll take considerable time for Moscow to rebuild its military. An investigation by Disability Rights International has discovered that thousands of young disabled children have been left behind in Ukraine. The charity's founder, Eric Rosenthal, told GB News that many of them are in institutions that don't have the facilities to cope. The refugees are the lucky ones. The kids with the more severe disabilities who've been left behind in these orphanages are in very dangerous situations. I mean, to the outsider, if you're in a nice clean room sitting in a bed, that may seem, okay, they're safe, but they're not safe. These children are being tied down at night. Um, a, a picture an adolescent, any adolescent that you know, lying in bed all day with absolutely nothing to do, sedated, um, uh, you know, uh, Children need love, they need attention. Um, simply warehousing them is, is not a safe alternative. And back here in the UK, railway workers are debating whether to take coordinated industrial action over jobs, pay and working conditions. Members of the Transport Salaried Staffs Association are meeting for their national conference in Sheffield over the next four days. The Rail Maritime and Transport Union are currently voting on whether to strike. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, let's get back to Neil Oliver. Given all that's happened, I might have expected overwhelming anger in the country by now. Loud calls for answers and apologies. Promises that mistakes made in the recent past, liberties taken, would not be repeated in the future. Also, maybe demands for change. Many are the dissenting voices. I know because I hear them every day. But the silencing and ridiculing still goes on. What I sense around me most of all now, however, is weariness. Council elections have been held up and down Great Britain. And apart from anything else, I think we can agree that turnout was low. In some polling stations in Hull, for example, turnout was down at 12%, apparently. In terms of numbers taking part, exercising their democratic right, it was a damp squib all over. 
As so often happens in these plebiscites, the day-to-day -day rule of the many has been decided by the relatively few who could even be bothered to vote. Among that minority are fervently committed activists, of course, those who see and know that power belongs to those who can be bothered. Most people are not activists, though. Most people have more than enough to do just keeping their heads above water. This depressing state of affairs is hardly surprising. In spite of the media's attempts to whip up excitement about the results, local council elections have been a lacklustre non-event. I think it's getting worse, however. I trotted along to my local polling station and made my marks on the paper. It took some effort, though. Along with so many people, I'm sure, I looked at the list of names and parties and thought, what's the point? What difference will it make? I looked at the names and knew what the results would be even as I went through the motions of completing my vote. We hear a lot of use now of the word Orwellian. It refers to the English journalist and author George Orwell, of course, he of the road to Wigan Pier, Animal Farm and 1984 and much else besides. I have a podcast in which, for the fun of it, I invite listeners to imagine that reading history is as close to time travel as a person might get. As the years go by, I wonder more and more if George Orwell wasn't actually a time traveller for real. So right has he proven to be about where decisions made and actions taken in the 20th century would lead future generations. In Animal Farm, his fable about communism, he predicted the abuse of trust and the exploitation of power. Once the pigs have control of the farm, they immediately set about taking advantage of their situation. When the other animals notice, for instance, that the pigs are taking all the milk and apples for themselves, while everyone else must eat tasteless slop, the pig's PR spokesman, called Squealer, explains the move is backed by science. Comrades, he tells them, you do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. Many of us actually dislike apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole object in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We are brain workers. The whole management and organisation of the farm depends on us. I read those lines again and think about the science we've heard so much about recently. I think too about all the news stories about how good it will be for us as well to eat bugs and lab-grown meat instead of the good stuff. That's science too, don't you know? Then I read about Bill Gates being the biggest owner of farmland in the US and wonder if it will be bugs and lab-grown meat he will produce from all those acres or maybe cattle for sirloins and corn on the cob for the barbecue. Who could say? Energy giant Eon recently sent pairs of polyester socks to customers with the message, energy down, CO2 down. Those literally in control of the power have been telling people to wear more clothes to fend off the cold rather than have heating in their homes. All the while this is going on, oil and gas companies report record profits and bountiful dividends for shareholders. Follow the science or follow the money, you choose. In Animal Farm, before the revolution, the pigs promised the animals that in future they would have electric light in their stalls, hot water as well as cold. Later on, once the pigs have control of the farm, such ideas are silenced. Napoleon, the leader of the pigs, says such notions are contrary to the spirit of animalism, which is their ideology. He tells them the truest happiness lies in working hard and living frugal lives. You'll own nothing a person might hear and you'll be happy. I read about socks in the mail from energy companies. I read about MPs awarding themselves a pay rise in excess of £2,000 a year. I listen to Boris Johnson justifying tax hikes and the rest. Asked by a reporter, what would you say to families trying to make ends meet? Buy cheaper food? Don't replace clothes? Turn down the thermostat or turn it off altogether? What should people do? Boris Johnson answered, people are obviously going to face choices that they're going to have to make. Frugal lives. Napoleon the pig would be proud. I don't know about you, but I don't expect to see Boris Johnson or Sir Keir Starmer or the rest of them waiting until the end of the day to hit the supermarkets in search of foods reduced to clear. I don't expect to hear about them choosing between eating and heating. In 1984, Orwell's novel about a dystopian future in which the population is kept in a state of perpetual fear on account of perpetual war with an enemy they never see. He wrote about how inconvenient facts and truth are memory hold, which is to say made to disappear. The protagonist is Winston Smith, who works in the Ministry of Truth, 
Among other state departments, there's a Ministry of Plenty, which is actually a Ministry of Starvation, dedicated to keeping the people in a state of perpetual poverty, scarcity and food shortage. In his booth in the Ministry of Truth, there's a slot in the wall into which Winston must post any document featuring information that's inconvenient to the government. Such data disappears at that point as though it had never been. Unless, of course, there comes a time in the future when the information is actually useful to the government again, at which point it miraculously reappears. Big pharma giant Pfizer have just released the next 80,000 pages of data related to the trial of their vaccine. 80,000 pages. Before barely a word of it is read, many are the voices insisting it's time anyway to move on and forget. It turns out you don't even need memory holes when information can hide in plain sight among a population too wearied and distracted by other more recent problems and fears to pay enough attention. The very people who would have us move on unquestioningly, politicians, journalists and others, those who demanded lockdowns longer and harder, are now in the habit of lamenting the harm done by such measures. All of a sudden, those that were ardent cheerleaders for the measures that have done so much harm have the unmitigated gall to fret publicly about the economy, about damage to physical and mental health, to the education and physical and emotional development of children. That they were the ones shouting loudest that we should suck it up and cancel Christmas to save Granny and the NHS is information that seems to have been shoveled by the barrow load into the nearest memory hole. I won't forget though, and neither will millions of others. And in among all of this, ordinary tax-paying, law-abiding people are simply and understandably exhausted. After two years of fear and anxiety and obeying rules that made no sense to them, many are on their knees. Into this climate of exhaustion came the local elections and surprise, surprise, most people had energy only for going to work and feeding their families. And in this way, enervating patterns are repeated. Another writer, Elena Gorakova wrote a memoir about life in the Soviet Union called A Mountain of Crumbs. In it, she described how the population was ground down by fear, want and hardship until people found they could cope best by pretending. The joke about the relationship with the state boiled down to they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. The state was lying to the people. The people knew they were being lied to. The state knew the people knew they were being lied to and still the state lied. It was all a great pretense, played by people with power against those with none. And just in order to survive, the mass of the population played their part by joining in the pretense. Many people are simply at the ends of their tethers, and why wouldn't they be? We look at our politicians and would-be councillors, at Conservatives and then at Labour and then at Lib Dems and the rest. We look from one to the other, at those who called for lockdowns, which is to say prominent members of every party, at those who wanted them in place quicker and harder and for longer. Now we see them clamour for more control, more censorship, more compliance. We look at each in turn and in our hearts and stomachs we wonder if it makes any difference who we choose because in truth they're all the same now. By the end of Animal Farm the pigs are walking upright on two legs and wearing human clothes. They carry whips in their trotters. In the final scene they host a meeting with neighbouring human farmers the same that they had once claimed to hate as the enemies of all animals. Four legs good, two legs bad, they had once said. The pigs live in the farmhouse now. The other animals left on the outside in the farmyard watch the pigs and human farmers sitting around the table, toasting each other and making plans to cooperate in the future. Quote, the creatures outside looked from pig to man and from man to pig and from pig to man again, wrote Orwell but already it was impossible to say which was which. Is it just me, or does it feel like someone out there is using Orwell's work not as a warning, but as an owner's manual? Now, all of that is my opinion, of course, but we like to hear from everyone on this show. So get in touch and tell us what you think on gbviews at gbnews.uk. And you can tweet us as well, at GB News. And I'll read out as many of your comments as possible in the time allowed later in the show. Time now to meet my panel, who will be with me until 8 o'clock. Welcome back to Lord Taylor of Warwick. Hello, Neil, sir. Hello. You're, uh, you've been with me before. It's good I to have. have you back. 
Uh, he's been a member of the House of Lords since 1996. And another familiar face uh, on this show and others, uh, the writer and education specialist, Tom Buick. Lovely see to see you again you. as well, Tom. Uh, Lord Taylor, I'll come to you first. Am I right in perceiving that the political parties are all blurring into one, that it's becoming harder and harder to tell the difference? To a certain extent, you're right. But I think there are people out there with vision. I think the media loves to look at the bad side rather than the good side. There's a glass of water in front of me on that table. I see that glass as half full, not half empty. Who are the visionaries? I think probably the younger generation. A true leader is a healer who brings people together. I hate what I call, and it's not in the dictionary, politics, which is the politics of division. And we're seeing that more and more now. That doesn't help the people. We need to bring people together. It can be done, but we may have to miss a generation. Now, you referred to Animal Farm many times, and George Orwell was a prophet, but a prophet of gloom and doom. That book, Animal Farm, was written and published in 1945. The original title of the book was Animal Farm, a fairy story. Then the publishers decided to drop the mm. latter part of the title. He was a, a gloom merchant. And he was I'm right. He, he had, you know, he was trading on fear, not faith. He was right. You know, Neely was wrong. Can I tell you why? <laughs> Look at the sweep of history. It's forward, you know? There are problems, of course, but man is so ingenious, creative, determined, resilient. We always come through the problems, even the COVID thing. We'll learn to live with it like flu. We'll come through this, Neil. There will always be roadblocks, but we come through them. I, we don't give up. I enjoy I, you your, know, he was wrong. I'm sorry, he was wrong. I enjoy wrong. your positivity, although <laughs> I, think he was, I think he was indeed a prophet. Tom, of gloom. <laughs> of truth. And do. <laughs> Tom, yeah. do we have the worst political leaders at the worst possible time? Come on to that point just a moment, just to respond directly to something uh, that Lord Taylor said. Actually, if we go back to 1945, there were two Winstons, Winston Smith uh, in Animal Farm and Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill lost the 1945 general election. He'd but, been a, but he won the war. He, he won the war, <laughs> but he lost the battle of ideas in the 45 election for the kind of society that British people wanted to create after the war. And coming back to directly to your question, Neil, we have politicians in political parties who have these great legacies behind them. The Conservative Party, the Labour Party, and dare I say even the Liberal Party, even though they haven't been in government apart from the coalition a few years ago uh, since the early 1900s. But what we haven't got today, unfortunately, are political leaders who are prepared to engage in a battle of ideas about how to move beyond the doom and gloom, to, cre you know, to talk about how we create a society in which we don't have food banks, we don't have people who are struggling to buy their own home, who, yes, worry about the environment, but equally worry about these green levies and taxes and being punished as mm. a generation to have to pay for it. Now, these debates are sort of going on, but I don't see at the moment in any of the mainstream political parties leaders who are prepared to bring that together in a narrative, whether that's a narrative of fear, you know, po politicians have got into office on the basis of fear, we know that, we've seen that in our history in this country and in other countries, but also the politics of hope. And love him or loathe him, Tony Blair, 25 years ago uh, last week, came to power in this country because what he offered the British people at that time was that key message of hope and how to after all those years of Conservative government, rebuild the country again with the investment in public services and a different approach to politics. Lord Taylor, to pick up on, on some of what Tom's saying, as, as well as blurring to the point where I struggle to tell the difference between Conservative and Labour and the rest, another example, or another challenge, is the way in which they seem so out of touch with the mm. real day-to-day -day concerns of people. And for example, in the aftermath of the local elections, all the excitement about what has happened to Westminster and Wandsworth and other London wards, as though that were of significance, the length and breadth of the country. You know, it's, that's, that matters to the people who live in those places, of course it does. And yet there's that London-centric obsession that that happening 
in, a, in, a, in, a, in London boroughs, m matters all over the country. When, when are the politicians going to see that it's a whole country in the main populated by people whose struggles and challenges and problems are not who has Westminster? I think the politicians do realise it's a whole country, but the media has this Westminster obsession. You know, I think that is... Uh, Do you think uh, it comes from I mean, the media, not from the politics? I think partly. Um, a lot of politicians have big ideas, but they fear the media. And this is a time now to say to them, forget party politics, rise above it. Something new and strange is happening in politics. Uh, Labour won Mayfair, but they lost Hull. You know, that doesn't make sense. What is going on? Mm. I look at someone like Keir Starmer, very polished, nice suit, well-spoken. But what does he stand for? Where is his vision? What's his focus? I, I just find him very unattractive. There's no charisma. If he threw a stone on the ground, he'd miss, you know? <laughs> it just, it's, it's just not connecting. He should be connecting better with a government that's been in power, in effect, for 12 years. And Labour did quite badly in the yeah. local elections. But what I... The reason why I refer back to the historic... Uh, heritage and legacies of these two great parties, Labour and Conservative, is because you could really ask the question, what is the point of Keir Starmer and the Labour Party at the moment when you have a in Boris Johnson and a Conservative government in Parliament with an 80-seat majority that has hiked taxes up to their highest in peacetime history, won't respond reasonably with a request, for example, either to put a, a tax on the uh, excess profits of North Sea oil. You might understand that if they're true Conservatives, but they won't even, for example, reduce 20% uh, VAT on energy bills as a way of helping those in the cost of living crisis. So my point is that we have this perpetual technocratic, some might argue a social democratic state, where it doesn't matter anymore whether it's Labour or Conservative that win these elections, because the direction of travel... I mean, I read an article this morning in The Telegraph, which is voicing a lot of disquiet at the moment about uh, you know, the Conservative Party, about the fact that when when George Osborne put up VAT in 2011 from 17.5% to 20%, it was at the time hinted that that would come down again to get us through the years of austerity. These taxes just get hard baked in and the people who pay the price are ordinary men and women and families in this country who, who have to keep on paying for this overburdensome technocratic state. Lord Taylor, you talked about the need for optimism, which I agree, there has to always be hope. And, and Tom, mm. you, you spoke about the need for, for ideas. Yes. And I, I do wonder, you, you, Thomas Hobbes, the, you know, the philosopher, mm. talked about the social contract, that we surrender some, in a civilised society, we surrender some freedom mm. in return for a society that works in the benefit for, for yeah. the largest number of people. Now, I say the social, I say that the politicians side of the social contract bargain has been broken, mm. seriously broken now. And I, I ask, I'll ask you, I mean, we're, we're running out of time before the break, but yeah. quite quickly, I suppose, is it time to look away from politicians for these new ideas, which I think we're all agreed that we need? Are we, are we going to get the, the, the continuation of the social contract and the ideas that we need for the future from the political class or, or, or are we literally getting to the point where we ought to set them aside and no, look for the ideas it's, elsewhere? It's a partnership between government the church, the faith groups, it's a true partnership. Mm. That's what is the answer. For as long as we settle these big questions via the ballot box, that's what democracy is, that is the access to power, we could have as many new social movements as you like people out there. People are drifting there. away. Look at the local of elections. Of course they are. 12% in some vision. It's about, vision. It's about the vision the people perish. Mm. It's about vision. We'll have to move on for now. After the break, uh, how much corruption is there in politics? I'll be talking with writer and podcaster Yaron Brook. Uh, after more allegations emerged concerning the American president's son, Hunter Biden. See you in a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr.
On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Claims of corruption in politics here in the United States and everywhere the species politician operates grow louder and angrier every day. It gets to the point where it feels like corruption in politics must just be a fact of life. For the past couple of years, the most talked about piece of computer hardware on the planet has been a laptop owned by US President Joe Biden's son, Hunter dropped off in a repair shop in Delaware in 2019 and never collected. It contains hundreds of thousands of emails and allegedly other content besides. My next guest is Israeli-American entrepreneur, writer and activist Yaron Brook, uh, chairman of the Ayn, at the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, he joins me now to consider whether political corruption is as endemic as COVID and if so, what might be done about it. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, does the Hunter Biden laptop contain evidence of corruption? Is I think so. I mean, it seems, it seems like it does. Uh, I don't know that we've seen everything. There's probably even more than what we're assuming. But he's clearly sat on boards of companies in Ukraine that he had no business doing, uh, that, he ha that he added no value to. And uh, there's something going on in China with some money that he got. So yes, I, I, I think there's certainly evidence of that. My, my, my gut reaction very early on yeah. um, was, why in Ukraine? Why was, why was Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, in, involved on the board of a company in Ukraine of all places? What was going on with that? Well, look, I think they find the opportunities where they are. I don't think, I don't think it was uh, targeted in particular. Ukraine is an incredibly corrupt place. Uh, so it's easy to smuggle somebody in who doesn't, uh, who doesn't really belong and who has, uh, has no value to add. But look, this is, this is not about the Bidens in particular. This is about American politics. This is everywhere in American politics. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot. You get these politicians going into office and they're almost always uh, quite, quite modest in terms of their income and wealth. And somehow they come out at the other side and they're fabulously wealthy. Uh, I remember an acquaintance of mine was a very senior guy in the Republican Party. Uh, he was, uh, I think, the leader of the, the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And then he lost. And guess the first job he got right after? Within a month, he got this job. It was a it was a, a Wall Street job paying him well into six figures, over a million dollars a year. Why? Because he knows finance really well? Because he brings some particular skill? Yes, the skill of who he knows and the connections he has and how government works. This is how it works. And uh, politicians are becoming in America extremely wealthy. Look at the Obamas. Uh, look at the Clintons. They, they weren't wealthy when they started. Uh, Hillary gets $250,000 to give a speech. Is that because, before she ran for president, I'm not sure she gets it today, is that because she's a brilliant speaker and she has this amazing new knowledge to, to, to give us? No, it's, it's because people are buying influence. And we're undoubtedly seeing the rise of new dynasties, are we not? I mean, you know, how many Bushes, how many, how many Clintons, you know, how many 
trumps. You know, you know it, it does feel as though there are new there are new lineages emerging that we will be. There's no question. I mean, this is what happened when you have corruption and when there is this infinite pool almost of resources out there, and if that money is going to flow to to people in power. And they're going to share it with their kids and with their family. Then we're going to be creating dynasties. Just today, I read that Kushner, uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law, just started a private equity fund. Uh, he has raised two and a half billion dollars for a fund. He wants to raise seven billion. He's raised two and a half billion. Two billion dollars of the two and a half billion comes from the Saudis. The Saudis he was very buddy buddy with throughout the Trump uh, administration. He helped them get a huge arms deal. Um, one wonders. One wonders why are they investing in me? He has no experience in private equity. He has no experience in what he's trying to do. But the Saudis are willing to risk two billion dollars. Well, because they bought influence. There's no question about it. If that's what it's about, if if we're in, if if the reality is that modern day politicians, particularly in the U.S., but I'm presuming elsewhere, if they are just identified by by Wall Street and elsewhere as the the prime source of influence and the prime source of contacts, how do you break that chain? It's not easy. But the fact is that the more government is involved in our economy, the more government interferes in our affairs, the more incentive there is for me to try to get them off my back uh, and to do whatever I can to get them off my back. So the more we, we have government grow and regulate and control, the more cronyism we're going to get, the more corruption we're going to get. That's built into the system. When government is small, when government is limited, when government doesn't tell me how I should live, it doesn't tell businesses how they should run, then there's no incentive to spend millions or billions of dollars to, to try to influence them because they have no impact on me. So I think the best way to get rid of cronyism, the only way really to get rid of cronyism and corruption, is to bring government back to its initial, at least in America, what the founders intended it to be. And they intended to be, in a sense, an agency of defense. They intended it to be an agency that protects our rights. Instead, it's become the number one infringer of our rights uh, in the world. It, it, it never was intended to run a healthcare system. It never was intended to run a financial uh, system. It never was intended to regulate every single type of business out there. It was intended to keep us, to, to keep crooks and criminals and fraudsters and foreign invaders away from us, to protect us from that. And we have moved over the last 250 years, we've moved further and further and further away from that original vision. And w as we move, every step we take, every time the government does more, there's more corruption, there's more cronyism, there are more people who have to gain from having influence on the government. So we need to shrink. We need to shrink government power. Tom, sh should we fear big government? Should we? Sh uh, where do you stand on that? Do we, is, is more I government good or, or, or should we aim for the minimum of government? I don't quite buy into this sort of market fundamentalist ideology, you know, going back over 250 years to a constitution that was framed at a very different time um, in our history. Uh, but equally, you know, um, I don't agree with state paternalism and, and I think that's really one of the great battles, whether you, wherever you are on the political spectrum that you have today, as I've said to you, I think before, Neil, I don't really see the great battle in the 21st century anymore between left and right. I see it as a battle between, uh, broadly, between libertarians and authoritarians. And I think where your politics sits will be usually somewhere between how you relate to either a more libertarian view of society or whether actually you buy into a kind of Chinese Communist Party view of the world, which is as long as material goodies are being delivered to you and your total standard of living increases uh, uh, from each generation to the next, you should just shut up, be quiet and be happy with what you've been yeah. given. Uh, big, where are you in that spectrum? Well, big Voltilla. government is usually bad government. Mm. It seems to me, and I'm married to an American, a Texan, you have to spend millions of dollars just to lose Shouldn't there be a cap on how much these candidates can actually spend, even at the Senate level? It's not an issue of how much they spend. It's an issue of how big the government is and how much there is to win or lose. But, but I agree. But money starts, you know, money, talking money. at that ground level, and then they start thinking, well, it's all about the money, the money, but, the But money. the fact is, in many, in many campaigns, the, the, the candidates with less money are the ones who win. It, 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 money and politics yeah. are complex relationships, but the fact is that the more power we give politicians, the more incentive there is to influence them. So, and I agree, 
about the spectrum. I think left and right are bankrupt concepts. Mm. I think we're basically individualism versus collectivism. And you have collectivism of the right, mm. and you have collectivism of the left, and our political parties today are collectivists of the right and left. And then you have individualism, which means freedom, which means free market. And what's sad is that nobody today on the political spectrum, nobody today with political visibility, ha is on the side of the individual, is on the mm. side of rights. And just one last thing, yeah. this idea of the right, the Constitution, the Constitution, I believe, is based, it's flawed. It was written 250 years ago, we could do mm. better today. But it's based on universally true principles. It's based on the idea of, of equality of rights. It's mm. based on the idea of uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I think are universal and timeless. And if we could return to those principles, we moved way away from them, yeah. the world would be completely different and, and the glass would be fully full, not just half full. Yeah, you see, this is where you see I go back to 1642 and an ordinance in the House of Commons <laughs> that actually, during the you know the heat of the Civil War, which made the point that, that that the House of Commons is sovereign. So you know we don't have a codified written constitution because we have the notion of popular national sovereignty, and therefore the priorities of the people change over time. And and of course you're seeing this now with the Roe versus Wade debate in America, where something that you thought was settled in your uh, American constitutional and socially progressive uh, history, like the, the basic issue of women's reproductive rights, is itself now being reopened but, and but questioned again at a constitutional because level. America was born out of the Christian faith, you know, the, mm. the pilgrim fathers that went from Plymouth to America. And I think that's got lost in the woods because mm. the churches have retreated and there's a gap between Parliament and the churches in this country as well as in America. Well, we're we're, we're going yeah. to we're, we're, we're going to disagree about yeah, that. There's, yeah. a, there's <laughs> a line that I, that, I, that, I, that I see that a quote from you: "Everyone has a moral right to pursue his own happiness." That's clearly redolent of the Constitution, yeah. free from coercive interference by others. Yes. Would you say that to some extent that's an upsum of? your solution to how we get government to back off and, you know, put the money down? I mean, I believe that that is a summation of not just my view of, of the solution to, to the problems we face, political solution, uh, but I think that is the vision of the Enlightenment. That is the vision of uh, the thinkers, the, the British and Scottish and French thinkers coming out of the 18th century that really created the modern world. Uh, the idea was individual liberty and individual freedom, trusting the individual, allowing the individual to take responsibility for their own life, to go out there and live and, and prosper based on, on their own action, or to fail. Failure is part of it, but failure is just an impetus to get up and go try again. So I think that very much this idea of pursuit of happiness is at the core of what created America, and I think it's at the core of what made Britain, uh, the United Kingdom, what it is. It, 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 it launched an industrial revolution, it launched an intellectual revolution, and it made these two countries unique in human history. Uh, so yes, I think if we can return to the idea that the role of government is to protect our freedoms, to protect us from coercion, to allow us to go out there and live with a capital L, then I think we solve all of our problems. But it came from a religious Base, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment is exact, but the Christian Enlightenment is the rejection of religion. The whole point of the Enlightenment, the 18th religion. century, is the rejection is of the religion God. and the adoption of a secular basis for individual you rights. Out of and that's how we're doomed. When we lived in a religious society, we were poor and miserable and life was horrible. No, the no. fact is that life has improved dramatically under a, secular, under a secular society. We're Christians. I think where we can probably find agreement, though, is that <laughs> whether, it, whether it be based in the Judeo-Christian tradition... Yeah, or whether that's it where it came from. It, and it we've lost about, that. It, I, mm. it is about the sanctity of the individual. Mm. It, you know, and that, that was something that's enshrined yeah. in the, in the Judeo-Christian yes. thinking. But it's, yes. also, it's also in some, of the, in some of the Enlightenment thinking. And Tom, what, it, it is, if we, we have to cherish the individual, do we not? And, and, and enable the, the individual to pursue their dreams freely? Of, yeah, of course we do. But you've know, also got to remember that uh, individualism, rampant individualism that isn't uh, checked by uh, fellow, fellow human beings, fellow citizens, that's not getting to the argument whether it should be government and collectivist measures, but that is the thing about human civilization. You know, we are not islands unto ourselves as individuals. If we were just nakedly pursuing our own individual self-interest on every single occasion, whether it's at the corporate level, 
oil companies going off and dumping things in our oceans or individual people exploiting people in their community no in order man is to an generate island. profit uh, from their misery which is you know what we're seeing right in front of us across the channel with this uh, uh, you know abhorrent sort of business model this is what happens i think when you don't have some kind of government that is there collectively i mean after all but, government but, isn't separate from the people yeah, that's but, the point but, but that's a, a false, democrat it's a false it is view of same... individualism because individualism is not the idea of living on an island it's not the idea of separate society because society is a massive other people a massive value to you the idea that individualists go around raping and pillaging is absurd indeed all the rapists and pillagers in the world and people who initiate war are always collectivists mm. right individualists cherish their life too much hmm. to actually go out and commit these uh, these horrific actions uh, that are, that are being. We don't need government to protect us. We need government to protect us from really bad guys. Hmm. But once you take out bad guys, even Adam Smith understood 250 years ago. It's pretty good. You know, the baker bakes the bread because he's trying to make a living. And he bakes the bread well. Why? Because that's what entails making a living and because he has pride in baking good bread. And that's also a self-interested action. Mm -hmm. So individualism doesn't lead to, to all these horrific outcomes. On the contrary, individualism is the solution to them. They, all the bad things that happen in the world today happen in the name of a collectivistic ideal. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think the solution is more freedom, not less, more individualism, not less a shrinking of government that allows us to, to, to pursue our values based on our own minds. Mm. You, you know, we, we treat other people as if they're too stupid to take care of themselves. We treat the poor as if they don't know what they're doing and, and they need to get, we need to give them a check and we need to give them health care because we think they're subhuman. But if we treated them as human beings with dignity and respect, then we'd accept the fact that they can take responsibility for their own lives. What we need is to create the space for jobs to be created so that they can go and work. Work is where you get kind of yeah, the dignity. Yeah, and it's Proverbs 16, verse 9. <laughs> Man makes his plans, God directs his steps. You leave God out of it, we're doomed. Man is not God. Well, wow. That's a fascinating debate. I'm so... <laughs> I so enjoy a lot of disagreement across this battle, I can tell you. Yeah, disagreement, yeah. but that's trade, isn't it? That's yeah. interaction, that's exchange. <laughs> exchange is what it's all about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yaron, thank you so much. Thank that's you. That's a conversation I hope that we can continue in days and months and ahead. A absolutely, look thank forward to it. Thank you so much. Right. After the break, uh, we'll meet this week's Great Britain, and I'm looking forward to welcoming the Bentley man, Mike Turlin, who overcame his own demons before setting up a charity to help people with their own mental health issues. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. 
My Great Britain tonight has been on a journey into darkness and back into the light. 13 years or so ago, Mike Turlin from Basingstoke felt his life had fallen apart. He reached his emotional rock bottom. Nowadays, though, the darkness is behind him and he has come up with a most unusual and unexpected way to help others. Mike joins me now. Mike, Thank you. I'm very pleased to see you in your colours, in your colourful plumage there. Excellent. Mike, what happened all those years ago? If you can talk us through your own journey. Yeah, well, in 2009, I looked at um, loads of different ways to end my life without obviously affecting too many other people. Why? What had happened? Um, my mum died. My best mate died. I split up from a quite a new marriage and I lost my job. And then what topped it off, I actually got arrested at my mum's funeral. And that's what obviously I thought I can't cope anymore. So I gave everything I owned away. And then obviously after all that sort of thing, I thought, well, obviously those attempts failed, which obviously luckily now I was disappointed at the time that they, they, I didn't succeed in ending my life, um, but they didn't. So I thought, okay, I need to turn my life around. So I was already, before I gave everything away, I was, going, I was going to loads of car shows and things like that anyway. So then I started to take my car show and I had a banner made that said, obviously, what you don't see from here apart from uh, is a flash car is, uh, is how I got here today. And but, but, but wait a minute, how did you, so, so you, you had a couple of attempts yep. to end your own life. What enabled you to begin to turn that around? You know, that's as low as a, as a person can go, you might say. How did you begin to climb back up? What um, made the difference? Well, I, I, I asked them to put me in a mental home um, because I got arrested. It was a choice of going to police cell or, or in a mental home. So I said, I'd rather go to a mental home. So I got put in a mental home and um, I asked them, obviously, kept asking them to talk about the issues I was suffering sort of thing, but they kept saying, we'd be with you, be with you, but no one actually come and talk to me. And um, so then I said, so I've got to get out. So I, I got out of there and then um, I, I was... Um, <sighs> I was thinking of what ways, I, I didn't have my best friend there because he, the, he was the one I always used to talk to um, because you need someone to actually open up and talk to. Um, so I took up modern drive, dancing and salsa and that's what I actually get my mind thinking positive on positive things. I got back into work and then I was dancing literally every single night of the week and weekends because I loved it. And also I didn't have time to think about all the weird stuff that was going on in my head because I think of all these weird stories in my head in times about two or three. So physical therapy to some extent. Oh yeah, yeah. It's something to get the mind thinking rather than the negative stuff I was thinking because I got diagnosed with bipolar and still got bipolar. Um, but it meant I could actually, I, I, I knew obviously what the signs and symptoms was obviously with my issues, obviously like, no, no, not drinking and this sort of stuff. And uh, I stopped taking my medication. I didn't say, and that's not for everyone, because obviously a lot of people still medication for for years. But I found it actually helped me because all it done it made me walk around like a zombie. Now, I mentioned that you had a you've got or you found a, a slightly unexpected way of of reaching out to people, communicating with people, and it has to do with a car. Yeah, well, I take my car. But tell me how you came up. Tell me about the car and how you. Okay. How you came um, to well, I I had a. An OK car, because obviously I started back to work and that sort of stuff, so I managed to save some money. And I got a car, and then I got a, um, a nice tax rebate, and then I saw a Bentley on eBay. And then I saw, the, um, I said to the guy, if you can deliver it tomorrow, I'll have it. And it came from Wales, and the guy delivered it without even me looking at it. And then it was dark blue, and then I had it all customised with white and gold, and now it's all got white gold roof, and it's all blingy, blingy, and it really stands out. So at car events, obviously, it stands out at car events, so people come over, and obviously with my banner, and I've got a little small Bentley. And what is your, what is your banner? What's your, the way in which you kind of invite people to, you know, to, to, to seek you out and to come and talk to you? Well, I say that the, the banner, it, it, it says, what, well, what you don't see from me is about, apart from the flash car is how I got here today. And obviously it, it says all about my story, where I tried to end my life, and that you can turn your life around, and about it's good to talk and have the ability to listen. And what, what is it, do you think, about the places that you go with your car? What is it that's, that's having people open up to you and talking to you about often very well, personal and intimate things? Well, one thing is they see my story, because they, then they know I've been through it. And then, because they're so relaxed, they don't expect to talk about mental health at a car event. And at so many events, I get so many people open up about their issues because they're not expecting to talk about mental health at a car event. 
and, and say, and they really open up, and whether it's a, a guy on a building site and things like that, or, or whether it's a counsellor, or whatever event I'm at, same uh, nurses, whatever, they all open up about their mental health issues. And you find yourself in those circumstances talking to people who have had suicidal thoughts. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I've had, like, 16-year-old kid and that sort of stuff has had suicidal thoughts, and, and there's so many people that have suicidal thoughts, and also other people that's actually... They've lost a family member or whatever, but also blame themselves because they don't see the signs and symptoms. In what sense? What do you mean by that? Um, well, like, when, when I wanted to end my life, I just went and done it. I didn't go around screaming around the road saying, I'm going to end my life, which a lot of people do, but they're the main, as far as I'm concerned, personal opinion only, um, they're the ones that are asking for help. Other people just go and end their life because obviously you're so rock, rock bottom and something triggers you and you think, I can't cope no more, no one's going to miss you, um, and, and sort of you, you go to end your life. But um, so many I pe people I speak to, they always blame themselves because they don't see the signs and symptoms. But th there is no symptoms when it comes to that. There is when you go around screaming and shouting, but it's like if you take um, Caroline Flack and you get uh, Robin Williams, they all, they just end their life. They don't, they didn't, so no one expected those sort of people to end their lives, but they did. Mm -hmm. And how many people have you been able, I mean, this, this started to happen to you in 2009. Yeah. How many people would you say that you've been in contact with in the years since? Oh, there's the, ugh. I, I lose count because obviously I get emails, I get, um, I get so many events that I do um, throughout the year. I do four, about 40 events a year. Um, and you imagine there's like, there could be 50 or 100 people at every event that I talk to, um, depending on the size of the event, depending if it's a thousands of people, then it could be like 150 or 200 people. It, it really depends. But let's, let's say everyone, they, if they're not prepared, to, ready to open up, then they just nod at me and smile and acknowledge that obviously they know exactly what I'm, they, I mean by my story sort of thing. It's wonderful to talk to you, Mike. The whole point of, of the Great Britain is to, is to take a pause and realise that, that, that there are so many people, perhaps invisible among us, who've had to overcome something, be it physical, be it mental, be it emotional, sometimes on their own behalf, sometimes they've they're responding to a, you know, a trauma experienced by somebody close to them. Mm -hmm. And rather than going down, they find the energy and the inspiration to come back up, which is what you've done. And the fact that you're sitting there in those, mm -hmm. you know, with, your, with, with the bright colours and that you reach out mm -hmm. to people in such an unexpected way, I think definitely makes you a great yeah. Britain. I think, yeah. Tom, you want to come Absolutely. in? Absolutely. It's great to see a Great Britain that is truly patriotic as well. Um, but, Mike, I just want to come back um, you know, to your point about triggers. You mentioned this, and because mm. you and I were talking in the green yeah. room earlier, and I was saying, you know, although I was estranged from my father for many years, so I grew up in foster care, but, you know, he committed suicide at the age of 59. And, you know, when you look at the figures, uh, you know, about 5,500 um, people commit suicide in the UK every year. Uh, actually, it's a higher mortality rate uh, than for COVID-19, but that's a, another uh, point I won't, uh, I won't expand any further. But when you drill down into those figures, um, three quarters of them are men. And the, the majority of them are between the age of 40 to 49. So what is it about something about being male, being middle aged, that mm. triggers that whole process that potentially leads to someone just wanting to and end not, their life? Not perhaps the demographic that's traditionally yeah. the best at opening up and talking. Yeah, which is why I think you know, Mike's approach, going around the country, these events, mm. this isn't like just going to a GP surgery, say, well, pick up a leaflet and register with your local mental health nurse, is it? This is, but this it's, is about it's young men as well. Terms. I mean, my uncle committed suicide when he was in his 20s. So, you know, but you've, you've showed that there's always hope, Mike. I mean, you're just an inspiration, yeah. to tell you that. Mm. But obviously, like, um, that's why I started, like, Construction Buddies, because obviously the suicide rate, they say it's like um, two men a, a day in construction commit suicide, but I'm almost certain now that's a lot more than that yeah. now. And, and every 40 seconds, which, again, I think that, that's, that's going to be a lot less than that, every 40 seconds someone in the UK dies through suicide. Mm. Um, and that's without all the other uh, mental health issues. Every 40 mm. seconds. Yeah. And you think that, and that's going to be a lot less, it's probably even a lot less than that now, because it is so, mm. it's, it's going to be probably even 30 seconds now, because mm. it's, the, the, with all the issues that people are suffering at yeah. the moment, the high fuel cost and the COVID and obviously yeah. home issues, and there's all that sort of stuff they're suffering That's the point with. I raised with you about um, middle-aged males. I mean, is there something about it's a taboo? 
still in our society for, for men who, you know, even in this sort of age of greater equality, still feel the pressure that they have to be the breadwinner. They're the, you know, if, if, if things go wrong, a redundancy, uh, a relationship breakup, that actually the pressure's on them to be the provider. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, yeah, do you come across that in your conversations with people? Yeah, not not so, not so much. Not like they they've got to be the breadwinner, but obviously there's so many people. I say I speak to every day about their issues, and but a lot of it's they're actually their family, home, their home life, and things like that, and then they bring that to work. Do, do um, they feel guilty about it? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's why I sort of like trying to get um, companies to actually do more for their staff. But obviously, yeah. it, it, it can't all be the companies that have no. got to do stuff. Yeah. It's actually got to be the individual yeah. knowing they've got an issue and, and actually starting to say, I need to talk to someone. Mm. But it's so, you're so right. Whether you, whether you realise that or it's, or it's, or it's you've happened upon it by chance, that being exactly as you say, at a car festival, Mm -hmm. yeah. People are there yeah. off guard in the best mm -hmm. possible way. They're just there with their mind on other things. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they find themselves in your company and almost without meaning mm -hmm. to, beginning the, the, the very difficult task of opening up and realising that, that they have a, a problem that they have to deal with. It's such a, an inspirational story. Thank you. That someone like yourself who's been through it and has come back from it and rather than not just getting on with your own life, you're taking all of making all of that effort to reach out to as many people as you can. It's, mm, it's such a great cool. story. So I, I'm going to shake you by the hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. But that's why I, I use 50% um, of my salary every month helping others. If I don't do that, I actually donate it to charities as well because I'm that passionate about helping other people and saving lives. Would you like to be Prime Minister, Mike? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, might be a vacancy yeah, soon. I could take it. I'll go for it, yeah. <laughs> I have to move on though. After the break, with fewer than 4% of England's rivers open to the public, canoeists are campaigning for access to more waterways. I'll be discussing this with Conservative MP Philip Dunn, who's the chair of the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee. Don't go away. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Woodson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Woodson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. I'm here until eight o'clock. Coming up in the next hour, railway historian Tim Dunn and the London Transport Museum's Sidney Holloway will be here to discuss their TV series, Secrets of the London Underground. Dr Stuart Gray will be here to talk about his report that has found krill could help older people fight the ageing process. And I'll be speaking to the anthropologist who thinks hobbit-like people believed to be extinct may still be living in eastern Indonesia. But first, let's get the latest news headlines from Bethany.
Thanks, Neil. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. Some breaking news to start with. Sinn Féin will be the largest party in the Northern Ireland Assembly for the first time, pushing the DUP into second place. The DUP's leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has said he accepts the outcome of the election, but that he will continue to pressure the UK government over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Sinn Féin's Vice President Michelle O'Neill has said the results represent a new era of partnership, not division. GB News' political editor, Darren McCaffrey, has sent us this update before the results earlier. Sinn Féin are describing today is a defining moment for change that it is ushered in a new era here in Northern Ireland as for the first time they have topped the poll, the first time a nationalist party has topped the poll here in Northern Ireland throughout its 101 year history. It comes as the DUP, the main unionist party, saw its vote uh, fall quite substantially as the unionist vote was split among many different uh, parties. Our oh, political political editor Darren McCaffrey there. Elsewhere, the Conservative Party has lost nearly 500 council seats across England, Scotland and Wales, with Labour, the Lib Dems and the Green Party making significant gains. In Scotland, the SNP remains the largest party, whilst in Wales, Plaid Cymru has gained three councils. Conservative MP for Stockton South, Matt Vickers, has said he feels positive about the results. It wasn't a bad night at all, really. Um, it, it wasn't great, but you know what? In context, uh, in fact, look back to Ed Miliband's time when he was in office in this same situation. He took 800 seats and we know how successful he was when it came to a general election. Yes, yeah, a tough night, but you know what? Universally across the country, it's a mixed message. In other news, Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister says all women, children and elderly people have been evacuated from the Mariupol Azov steelworks. It follows Ukraine's military saying Russia had continued its assault on the plant with the help of tanks and artillery fire. Russian missile strikes have also hit the southern port city of Odessa. UK intelligence has said the war is taking a heavy toll on Russian units and that the sanctions mean it'll take considerable time for Moscow to rebuild its military. And a security breach where the Home Secretary was heckled by activists at the Conservative Party event is under investigation. And um, I actually just want to start... Priti Patel, your racist policies are killing people. Seven young people from the Green New Deal Rising group attempted to disrupt Priti Patel as she addressed the party members in Nottinghamshire. The protesters had brought, bought tickets to the annual Tory Spring Dinner last night, posing as young Conservatives. They were protesting against the government's plans to send migrants to Rwanda. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now let's get back to Neil Oliver. Thanks for that, Bethany. Now, less than 4% of England's rivers are open for use by the public. Now campaigners are trying to change that, calling for right of access to blue spaces. Philip Dunn, who's the Conservative MP for Ludlow and the chair of the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee, joins me now to discuss how England's rivers might be opened up to canoeists, swimmers and whoever else really wants to make peaceful use of them. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining me. Good evening, Neil. Uh, first of all, I have to say I was, I, I was surprised by this story, uh, given that the situation in Scotland, my homeland, is quite different, is it not? Yes, I think in Scotland nearly 20 years ago, I think it was 2003, legislation was changed alongside the, the right to roam, there was right to access over navigable waterways uh, in Scotland. Uh, that doesn't apply in England. And I think in the last uh, 10 years or so, something like uh, 500 miles of rivers have been opened up for public access through uh, agreements with uh, the riparian owners of the riverbanks. Now, as, I, as I've been following the story, I see that canoeists, as it happens, are to the fore uh, in this campaign. What kind of troubles and, and difficulties have they faced in pursuit of their hobby uh, that's, that's drawing attention to this problem? 
Well, sort of my interest in this area came about through the committee that I chaired, that you mentioned in your introduction, the Environmental Audit Committee. We did a report into water quality in rivers, and we were really looking at it from an environmental perspective. But we had evidence from a number of groups that use the rivers, including the British uh, canoeists, the, uh, some of the swimming organisations, many of the angling organisations as well. And, you know, there is... Uh, there is an, some competing use for uh, you know, us human beings using our rivers. There's always been a bit of tension between uh, the fishermen, the anglers and the canoeists. Um, uh, but what we were keen to do is to try to encourage the government to, uh, to work with uh, many of the, sort of the river groups to improve water quality for the, the species that live in our rivers, as well as for the human beings who use them. So we were calling for uh, increased bathing water quality status across the river network in England. We've done quite a good job over the last 20 years or so in improving the quality of uh, waters in our, on our coastlines. And, and you'll know more about this than most people, given your uh, work uh, in presenting coast uh, over the years. Um, uh, but we've done much less well in, in bathing water quality in rivers and lakes. In fact, there's only one river at the moment which has bathing water quality status, and that's the River um, Wharf at Ilkley in Yorkshire. It does seem extraordinary that only 4%, you know, we think of, you know, England green and pleasant land and all of that, many waterways, uh, that, that people wanting to do something as benign as, as go for a paddle or go for a uh, a swim or, or, or indeed to go canoeing, you know, can, can run across all of these absolute obstacles to them doing something that sounds so peaceable. Mm. Well, I, I agree with you. I think we need to have uh, much greater access to our waterways, but it has to be safe. So we have to ensure that when people want to use, the, uh, the, use our rivers, for, whether for swimming or canoeing or fishing, they can they do so in a way that is both safe for them and also safe for the species that live in them. So it's I don't I think a free for all um, you know may be quite problematic. I haven't seen the evidence in Scotland, uh, and it's something that I'd be interested to look at as to whether it's given rise to particular problems. But uh, we are certainly calling for an increase in bathing water quality status, and a number of the water companies have started to introduce plans ahead of government uh, response to a consultation that they've been having on the whole issue of water quality. Um, and uh, so, for example, in my area, uh, uh, as you say, I, I represent Ludlow, which is in the West Midlands. The Seven Trent Water Company has introduced a policy last month uh, to try to ensure that over a, a period of time, everybody who lives in their area, and it's a landlocked um, area that they serve, it was within uh, an hour of drive, driving distance from somewhere where they can do while swimming or swim or have access uh, to our waterways, whether rivers or lakes. Uh, I think Northumberland Water has been coming up with uh, a, a similarly um, uh, sort of ahead of the government ambition. I think they want to have 500 kilometres of uh, waterways um, of bathing water quality status uh, by 2030. You talk about the the pollution, and you know we hear again and again and again of of of, of water companies releasing untreated sewage into waterways and all of the rest of it, it, it would seem reasonable to imagine that the more people, canoeists, swimmers, uh, other people wanting to make use of the waters, the more people uh, as, as possible who, are, who have a stake and, and an, an interest in the quality of the water in our waterways, the better. Well, yes, and I think a lot of people during the pandemic when they were constrained from doing things uh, indoors with other people, look to the outdoors, and particularly in that first lockdown when we had such amazing weather in, in that period of March and April in 2020, uh, there was a huge increase in, uh, in the use of our waterways for swimming um, and, and presumably for canoeing and paddleboarding and, and the other uh, activities that people can uh, use the waters for. Um, but what was also clear to us from our committee was that we don't have good quality uh, water within our rivers at the moment. We've, in fact, got only 14% of, uh, of English waterways are of good status, uh, and, uh, and we've got to change that. So th there is a lot of work to be done, uh, partly by the water companies in reducing their sewage discharges into our rivers, but also by farmers in reducing their uh, the phosphates and nitrates that 
uh, flow into our rivers from farming practice. Uh, and the government is very keen to get on top of that. So we are awaiting uh, the result of a consultation uh, about how uh, storm overflows in particular, which is one of the, the right 20,000 uh, outflow pipes from um, sewage treatment works and, uh, and, and uh, sort of lesser water company assets, which are polluting our river, riverways. I mean, we, we, don't, we want to make sure that if people are swimming in the river, they know whether there's been a discharge or not. And that's a... And a big change is coming about as a result of the legislation that was brought in, uh, in the, under the Environment Act last year, that there will be monitoring of all of these outflows in near real time, and that information will be made available to the public. So if you want to go swimming or paddleboarding or canoeing on a stretch of river that you can get access to, you will be able to check online in, in a few... In a, few couple of years time we don't know exactly when it will all come in as to whether or not there's been a significant uh, pollution event sewage discharge on that stretch of river and i think that will make it much safer for people to be able to take advantage of these great outdoor sports such an important story philip you know it's something that should be and i think is probably close to many of our hearts you know that these these waterways are the are the veins and arteries of the countryside and you want them in good health uh, and I think anything that, that makes people more aware and indeed the, the, the effort to give more people access to those beautiful places uh, is such an all-encompassing story. So, Philip Dunn, uh, Conservative MP for Ludlow, thank you for bringing it to our attention and all the best with the campaign. Thank you. The London Underground, better known as the Tube, of course, was used uh, for nearly 300 million passenger journeys last year. 300 million. It has 250 miles of track, there or thereabouts, and 272 stations. The tube map, designed by Harry Beck in 1931, is an icon of design. The network is nothing short of a marvel, and every time I take a trip on it, I think, how on earth did this ever get built, and how on earth is this even possible? My next guests are the presenters of TV series Secrets of the London Underground, and they're here to celebrate the wonder that is the tube. Uh, Sydney Holloway from the London Transport Museum and railway historian Tim Dunn here with me now. Welcome. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. This is great. I um, Years ago I became aware of, um, of, a, of a group who call themselves the Underground Explorers. Okay. Who were in the business of finding, you know, places, subterranean places that had been forgotten, had been mothballed and they, they made a point of going in and taking photographs and it, it, your story immediately made me think of that. You must have had access, City, to some <laughs> really, really spectacularly unexpected places. Of course. I mean, that's, I think that's what really inspired the series in the first place, because I work for the London Transport mm. Museum, and we have a programme that takes the public into some of these spaces. Right. And so that's how the, the, the idea was born to do the series, because I think we're all fascinated by the underground, by the what's there. So, so as well as the, the, that part of it, that we know all the tunnels yes. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the journeys that we make. What are some of the, of the most surprising hidden aspects of the tube? Well, mm. you, you've heard of places like these ghost stations, right? So we've got one opposite, almost Harrods, which is uh, Robson station. Road. They've got ghost stations because they're sort of, they exist in this kind of ethereal place between reality and not reality, kind of forgotten, but not. We know they're there. Mm -hmm. You sort of know they're there, and it feels like they shouldn't be there. So there's Brompton Road opposite Harrods, which has mm. been shut off for what, since 1930s from the surface, a lot yeah. of it? Yeah. Why would it go out? Why would it be lost? Well, it, it, the stations are, are disused for a number of reasons. There's, it, it's, you know, you have to remember the underground is 159 years old and, you know, they were building it as almost an experiment at the turn of the, of the 19th and 20th centuries and, and they were trying to figure out, you know, how to make this profitable. They, you know, all of the lines used to be privately run companies uh -huh. and they were doing it for profit. So the Piccadilly line was built, you know, in, in that kind of... Way, but then they realised once it got under government control or more centralised control, they realised actually we've got too many stations and it's it's taking too long to go through central London. So let's look at the ones that people aren't using as much. So there are loads of different reasons like that, but normally it's an organic growth that requires parts of stations to close. We've got we've got underground stations that have been closed down. Some have been absorbed and changed around a bit. We've cut off different bits. We've also found the places that you had no idea they're even part of the underground. So we've got Greenwich Power Station, yeah. which is the emergency backup power station for the underground. It was built for the tramways, yeah. um, but it's now there with these big jet engines that act as turbines. Wow. So in case of a London-wide power supply failure, 
These things can power up within a few minutes and supply the whole tube and just get all the tubes out of the tunnels and get all the people yep. up the escalators. So if the if the worst happens and all the lights go out, yeah. there's a backup plan to get everybody <laughs> into yeah. the daylight yeah. again. Isn't that wonderful? That's the thing. And a yeah. team look after this thing day Has it ever day been out? needed? No. No, no, no. But um, we, 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 well, we got to explore it because, I mean, I used to live around the corner from there and ran past it all the time. I used to kind of think, what is that building? This it's like Walker's Chocolate ago. Factory, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> because it sits and it's kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's so big. But, yeah, it would be able to power the underground for about 30 minutes. Wow. That's it. Now, the other thing that strikes me, it's easy to overlook it because normally when you're going through the tube, it's just get through it and get up onto the street again as fast as possible. That's the idea, right? But it, <laughs> sometimes I, I, I remember to look at it and I think it's all so beautiful. Yes. And it's, it, there's very much a style mm. to, to, the, to the presentation and the design, the architecture of the place. How did, did who had the, was there, a, was there an overarching vision yeah, I mean, yeah. different eras, actually, haven't there? Yeah. There have been diff different architects, and there's one particular one, Leslie Green, who was the first sort of major architect who did, what, 50 stations by the time he was 30? Two, yeah, yeah. I mean, incredible. There's wonderful what's those ox blood red tiles on the outside. Mm -hmm. This is the language of London. You know, th yeah. These are buildings that kind of are, are a backdrop, aren't they? So you mentioned that we've got this, this idea of this, this look. You've got the typeface, you've got the logo, you've got the colours, and the stations as well. Well, it's all a centralised idea because it, it, it kind of was born from um, the man who, who was the marketing director of the underground group back in the early 20th century called Frank Pick. Mm -hmm. And his idea was that there, as well as being a functional railway, it had to inspire people as well to be beautiful places, functional, but, you know, something that made people or well, elevated the spirit, so to speak. So from that, they started commissioning posters oh, and all pictures. sorts of things. I mean, look at that. It's yeah. so instantly recognisable. Yeah. Yes. And it's still growing, isn't it? I mean, you, yeah. there's a, you know, the Jubilee line came on, whenever, I can't remember now how long ago that was, but there's, there's, there, it's being added to again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the Jubilee line you mentioned, of course, and we, we've just had the, the Northern Line that have been down to, uh, to what? Battersea Batsy Power Station Station, yep. down at the end. Uh, and of course, we've got Crossrail as well, which is looking fabulous. I mean, it, it's just line? remarkable stuff. <laughs> I, it beggars belief when you pause for a moment to think what's already under the ground, yeah. you know, in terms of our power and the, the, the plumbing and the, the sewerage systems, how on earth is it even possible to push through a to tunnel add, big add enough for it. trains? I know. Well, go you, deeper. Well, this is the thing. <laughs> the Elizabeth Line, for example, we, we go there in, in one of the episodes and really get to go behind the scenes of the Elizabeth Line as well just to see how they managed to fit these enormous cathedral-like buildings within the fabric of London. And I mean, have they gone under? Have they yes. Just gone, yes. Uh, you know... In many places. I mean, at Tottenham Court Road, I think the closest they came to the running of the Northern Line was 60 centimetres. Yeah. Wow. And they kept trains running during that time as well, which is always remarkable. But yeah. the, the Crossrail stations, they're like great big spaceships. Like mm. They've landed underground. They are gleaming, they are white, they are remarkable. I mean, they are, they are things of beauty. So will the Elizabeth Line be the deepest that the London Underground has ever been? <sighs> Technically, I think as, as an average, it would probably will be, but... Um, I'm not entirely sure because it kind of ebbs and flows. I mean, of course, one of the deepest parts of the of the tube is on the northern line when you go up to Hampstead, but that's just because the height of which the tunnels are and the and the hill. What <laughs> kind of what kind of depth are we talking about? Because of course, uh, the, when you're on the tube, mm -hmm. you're completely disorientated. You have yes. no sense of where you are. Yeah. So how how deep can one be sometimes on the tube? They are an average about twenty meters if you're in the deep tube, which is the northern line, the Piccadilly, the central around 20 metres, 18 to 20. You can go up to about 34 metres, which is the equivalent of about 16-storey building. Or, of course, even shallower than that, on the subsurface lines, the yeah. cut-and-cover ones, the early stations, the cut early lines. cover Yeah, mm. so when they first built the underground, the Metropolitan Railway built their first line between Paddington Station through Baker Street and across to Farringdon Street, that over the top, to connect all those railway stations in London that couldn't come into the middle. So they said, OK, how do we put this out there? They dug up the road, dug up front gardens, mm -hmm. and literally just excavated it and put the train tracks down underneath and built a bridge over the top and a tunnel and covered and cut it over again. Yeah. So these things are really just, what, sort of two or three feet beneath the road surface? Yeah. Well, about that, 
There's a wonderful, there's a novel by Julian Barnes, Metropolitan, yes. which I think is, which is all, well, it, it, it goes into some of the, you know, the, the existence, because it was a way to, to connect London to the suburbs, or yeah. what became the suburbs, wasn't it? Yeah, the Metro Land. It's one course. of Tim's yeah. favourites. <laughs> Metro Land, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm a product of that area, I'm a product yeah. of Metro Land. So, to me, this, this whole thing is about where we live. And this programme isn't really about tube trains, it's not about the lines necessarily, no. it's about how it, it genuinely, it genuinely has shaped this city, and, mm. and, and the people in it, and it, Say the stuff we see on the, on, on the screen, the designs and the shapes and the iconography yeah. and the stories and the people that are behind it are fascinating. And why things have shut down, Second World War or beyond, they have repercussions across the country. Yeah. What about those stories that, we, that we've heard about from time to time? I remember hearing that uh, Winston Churchill mm -hmm. had, a, had almost like private access. Yes. To, uh, his train or a train stopped only for him to well, get him access to it was the, him and a few the, other executives. It's a, a place called Down Street, which is between Hyde Park Corner and Green Park, which was the headquarters of the Railway Executive Committee during the Second World War. So um, it's actually a place where so Tim met, and I yeah, we met visited um, years ago. Um, actually, down the road from there is Brompton Road, the station we were talking about that closed in 1934. That was the headquarters of the anti-aircraft anti brigade in London, and it actually had direct radar connections coming from Hyde Park to it to know where the, the, the planes were going and, and how they could shoot it down. And uh, are, there other, um, are there other species that the, that the underground gives access to that we wouldn't necessarily know about because they're just they're, you know they're not generally open to the public. You know, the, I'm, I'm imagining you know maybe where they park trains and and, yes. and maintenance. You know, yeah. are there other spaces? I mean, who knew that a Waterloo station there's a huge depot for the underground trains of the Waterloo and City Line? And of course, you have to have a depot because they, they, it's, it's a short railway to, line. Yeah, and they need to maintain the trains somehow. Of course, and they, they, they live underground on this little, this little sort of maintenance depot, mm -hmm. and they, they get craned out once in a while. They change the stock over there, bring a big crane in, and take the carriages out one by one out of a big hole in the ground. It's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. down at King William Street, there's that one one. It's on the riverside. This station shut down in what 1903, 05. Ish. 1900. 100, even earlier. 1900, so and, it's and, and, the old, it, one of the oldest. Yeah, these little trains came around the corner, but they were so underpowered, these early trains, they couldn't get around the corner and up the hill to King William Street. So within, what, three or four years, they shut this line down and bypassed it with a brand new line. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I lived down near the London Bridge, and I had no idea that underneath Borough High Street, there are two tunnels that run the entire length of Borough High Street. They're the old, effectively, Northern Line tunnels. We yeah. went down to have a walk yeah. along. Yeah, I've yeah. been doing this walk down for, what, 10 years now? And I had no idea they're there. And so yeah. this programme goes, hang on a second, what's down there? And what's over there? And what's behind that door? And we go, oh, let's have a look. Yeah. Someone gives us the keys <laughs> and off we go. Yeah, that's um, it. But even to so many tube stations, you think you know your tube stations, right? You think you know your local tube. This proves you, yeah. you don't know your local you place. Don't. It is absolutely, it is the part of, uh, the, the beating heart of London, isn't yeah. it? Mm. It's impossible to imagine London without the tube. It's impossible to imagine London functioning. It wouldn't. I mean, you, you know, when anything goes off, you know, wrong or anything like that, it does paralyse the city very quickly. But, you know, even so, you have to think, most of the underground that we have today was built over 100 years ago. So, you know, think about the fact that when you're walking through a station, say you're just on your way or you're commuting or anything, there have been people walking through that station since a hundred years ago. But, you know, it's so funny because we don't think of that, that you know, the underground as being, you know, kind of a, a beautiful building. You know, if you walked into a church right. that was a hundred years old, you'd be like, wow, this is a hundred year old church. That's right. It is, when, a it is a building. Yeah. It's just that it's a buried building. It's, it's a, a buried building. building. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and when you, I always feel when I'm walking through, the, not so much when I'm on the train itself, but the, the, the myriad rain passageways and tunnels <laughs> that move. And sometimes when I'm walking through one, I think, how on earth did someone work this out? Yeah. It is extraordinary. It's I mean, when you thing see to build those, above, but... yeah, and you see these uh, axonometric drawings, which are basically sort of three D in the ground, and it does do the job for you because you kind of go, okay, and I see, I see. But I mean, today they have lasers. You know, they can be absolutely precise on how they do this and and um, you know where to tunnel and whatnot. But when it was first opened, they had no idea. No, well, they just had to uh, give it and a go. That, I mean, I mentioned at the top that map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, not the, the the greatly you know the one that takes in the entirety of it, but that heart of the matter yeah. is so instantly recognisable, isn't yes. it? You know exactly 
what you're looking at from yeah. the merest glimpse. And yet it has actually changed quite a lot over time. People say, oh, you know, the iconic map has never changed. It really has, hasn't yes. it? And because you know, it started off with, with a kind of a, an as you, as a, I suppose, a, do you call it a, um, a real life map, I suppose, as you would do a normal, normal sort of a geographic a map. A geographical map. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Then it moved into Harry Beck's version. But actually, over the years, it got pulled apart. And it became, over the 1970s to 1980s, actually, the map got pretty much wrecked. Mm. And it wasn't until the 1990s that you saw the map coming back again into its current form, into its, its true sort of circuit board style, rather elegant version. Mm. It's a wonderful story that Harry Beck, he, he, he kind of he campaigned to the head of the underground, please look at my map, please look at it, please look at it. And eventually yeah. he broke, went, OK, well, look at it. They tested two different maps, the underground version and Harry Beck's map, and Harry Beck's map won. Yeah. It's a lovely story. It's so clever because it doesn't really bear any it doesn't, relation yeah. to the... To the to the, the relationship between the stations, yeah. but it gives you all you need, which is how do I get from here to there? That's the thing. In a well, schematic. It's it's focusing on interchange rather than telling you geographically where you are. So yeah. it's it's also something that confuses visitors to London, right? Because they'll see it and they think, wait, but the river should be there. <laughs> and you're like, mm, it's actually a little bit different than that. But you know, it's the same thing. It's like you know that map, the roundel, the TFL roundel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is one of the most recognised symbols in the world. You see that no matter where you are in the world, and you go, that's London. That's home. That's home, that's London. That's London. When is the series on? Where is the series on? Where do people find it? It's on every Thursday night at 8 o'clock on the Yesterday channel, and it's also on UK TV Play on a catch-up. It's brilliant. What a fascinating topic. I could talk about it for much longer, but I've run out of time. But thank you both for coming Thank you for having thank us. You. Best of luck with it. That was terrific. After the break, I'll discuss whether krill, or in fact oil from krill, could help people fight the ageing process. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us, 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. An oil derived from tiny marine crustaceans might boost muscle strength and brain function as we get older. The little critters in question are krill, uh, near the bottom of the food chain in the world's oceans and an important food supply for whales, seals, penguins, squid and many species of fish. New research completed by a team from Glasgow University uh, has found that krill might well prove vitally important to us humans as well. I'm joined now by Dr Stuart Gray, who led the research by the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Sciences at Glasgow Uni. Hello there. Thank you for making time for us. No problem, Neil. How are you? Good, good, thank you. Now, explain to us, uh, as non-scientists, why is 
oil from krill a potential benefit for us as we age? So it's a tricky question. Uh, we don't really know exactly what what it is in the in the in krill that's actually having the benefits, but we think it's probably the omega three fatty acids. So similar to oily fish, you have two main fatty acids called we'll call them for short EPA and DHA, and these incorporate into every cell within the body, and it's something we don't have an awful lot. Most of the the fatty acids in our body are omega six. Uh, if we increase our consumption of oily fish or krill. We can displace them and we can put these omega-3s in. And what they can do, we think for muscle and for other bodily functions, is they can help to reduce inflammation. So unfortunately, as we age, we we get a little bit of inflammation, uh, not as much as if you were severely ill, if you had a heart attack or you were uh, undergoing a, a severe illness, but we just get a little bit of inflammation and it can dampen the processes involved in muscle growth. So uh, the kind of building of muscle proteins. By increasing our omega-3 intake, then we can dampen a bit of that inflammation and that kind of relieves some of the stress placed on muscle as we age and that allows muscle to grow more like when it was a, a younger, healthier muscle. Uh, not quite the same. It doesn't take us all the way back to when we were 16, 17 years old, but it gets us some of the way back there. So in inflation is the great is the great enemy as time goes on, do you, do you see, do you see um, uh, people who live by the, by the sea, and, as, and by extension people who eat a lot of oily fish, H historically have those populations aged better and, and been healthier and more cognitively sharp in, than, than people who live in the interiors of continents? Yeah, so, I, I mean, my work focused mostly on muscle aging, so not the not the brain side. Uh, but from from that point of view, a lot of the early work here came from Inuit populations where it was more cardiovascular because inflammation is also involved in cardiovascular disease. And what they found was that despite the really high fat diet that Inuit populations had, very very few of them ever had heart attacks or any cardiovascular disease, disease at all. And we think that although it was high fat intake, it was these omega-3 fatty acids they were taking. Kind of following on from that, looking at muscle, there have been big studies looking at population level uh, cohorts, groups of people, and they found that people that do eat more fatty fish on a kind of weekly basis will have greater muscle strength. Obviously that kind of work can be what we would say confounded by people that are eating more salmon, are probably having a slightly healthier lifestyle in general. You can try and account for that in your analysis. You can never get rid of it fully, but it does indicate that. So I've not really answered the coastal question because nobody's really studied specifically people at the coast, but if they do eat more fish, they, by virtue of that, would probably have the, the higher muscle uh, strength and, and the, the better protection as, as we age. Don't we, the, those, when there are studies about uh, the those populations that have the most uh, centenarians, you know, extreme long life, yeah. you know, the Mediterranean diet, and, and there's, a, you know, there's a, 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 a diet amongst the fisher folk of, of some of the Japanese islands that seems to lend itself to long life. So you'd be, you'd yeah. be invited, would you not, to, to draw the conclusion that it's the fish in the Mediterranean diet, perhaps, and the, and the fish that, that Japanese people traditionally were eating that's been boosting their, their, uh, their longevity. Yeah. It's, it's going to be it's going to be one, but it's going to be a part of. Obviously, it's a it's a bigger picture thing, and longevity itself is is more complex. But I think sometimes we think of just living longer. But if we can improve things like muscle function, and it might sound relatively benign, you know, it's just your muscles have got a wee bit stronger. But that gives you a greater quality of life. So hopefully, we can maybe not extend longevity, but we can extend healthy lifespan so people can hopefully enjoy their later years more than they currently are. appreciate that you said that you have concentrated specifically on the, on, on the more on the cardiovascular side than on, the, than on the, the brain tissue side. Is it the same uh, gift though from the oil? Does it reduce inflammation? Is that why it's, it's helping with you know, prolonged positive brain function? 
he, he, partly that as well, uh, but also one of these omega-3 fat, fatty acids, DHA, is actually incorporated into nerves. So it can help. And that's one of the ways we actually think it might improve muscle as well, is that it's not necessarily improving the muscle itself, it's improving the signal from the brain to the muscle because it incorporates into the nerves. Because nerves have got a kind of fatty sheath around them. So if we can get more DH into these, DHA, this omega-3 fatty acid, into the nerve, then we improve the signal kind of going to, in our case, we're looking at muscle. But obviously, that's it's going out to all the all the parts of the body. So you would get overall improvements from that. Now, you and I are both Scots. I'm, I'm hearing that in your accent, obviously. Yeah. Um, are you aware, as I am, that for, for some reasons I've never really understood, we Scots have a strange relationship with seafood? Uh, you know, fish and chips, yes, but when you think about all yeah. the shellfish and wonderful seafood that, that gets loaded into crates and, and shipped off to, to Europe and elsewhere, maybe it's time that, that, that we Scots in particular you know, thought about the, and were aware of the, you know, not just the fantastic flavours and tastes and textures, but that it might actually be helping us live better and live longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it is, it's a kind of Scottish salmon known around the world, but the if we look within, within Scotland and the wider UK, the median fatty fish intake is zero. So that's the kind of middle number. If we took the whole population of Scotland counted up how much fatty fish each person eats, the middle person consumes zero. So it is, and I'll put my, I'll put my hand up and say that I am, I'm one of those people that don't, don't eat an awful lot of uh, fish at all, not even fish and chips, fatty fish, no. So it is, I, I think it is something that we, we do need to work on. It's also though where, I think that's in an ideal world, but we, we can get these through other, we can get them through supplements as well. And I know some people prefer whole food, and I, I kind of go to whole food where possible. But if you don't like fatty fish or you can't afford to get fatty fish, then you do have the option of getting these these omega three fatty acids and the other benefits from from uh, from supplements. But obviously, with fatty fish, you, you've got other things because oily fish. We talk about oily fish, but it's not just these fatty acids. They've got vitamin D in them. They're a good source of protein as well as omega-3 fatty acids. So there's a lot more benefits you could get if we do increase fatty fish consumption. It is one of the, the healthiest things and one of the things we have, as you say, around our shores in, in abundance. A very a very illuminating story, Dr. Stuart Gray from Glasgow University. And uh, it's, uh, it's, always, uh, it's always fascinating to me to be reminded about just how good it is to pay attention to food, natural food, whole food, and why should it be a surprise? The benefits thereof. Uh, but thanks for making yeah. us think about that uh, this evening. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Coming up after the break, would it help the planet if we were to eat more seaweed? And could there be a tribe of hobbit-like people living in East Indonesia? <gasps> so much variety. See you shortly. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. 
We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Woodson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Woodson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight in The Big Question with Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries looking at the licence fee, we ask, does Britain still need the BBC? Debating that will be broadcasting legend Dame Esther Ranson and former chairman of Southampton FC and ex-Brexit party MEP Rupert Lowe. My Mark Meets guest is Brookside Shameless and Celebrity Big Brother star Tina Malone. And reacting to the big stories of the day is my all-star panel, including Olympic legend Chris Akabusi. And in my big opinion, the Queen is right to give Prince Harry that balcony ban. See you at nine. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. We are all only too aware that food prices are rising and are predicted to go ever higher with fears chicken might soon cost more than beef. So should we be exploring more sustainable and indeed cheaper options? Well, a scheme in Northern Ireland involves showing people what they can forage for when out walking. GB News Northern Ireland correspondent Doogie Beatty has the story. The sea may be full of sustenance, but how much of it do we walk past on the shoreline? For years, seaweed has been included in the diet of Northern Ireland. And now Michelle Wilson is explaining to a new generation the benefits that it brings. So traditionally our ancestors would have foraged the beach for seaweed. Mostly they would have foraged for what we would call schlock. Um, if you go further around the coast, it's called schlock. It's what the Japanese wrap their sushi in. So basically it's nori. Um, and they would have used it after the first frost as a cure for uh, remedies and colds. And it was a big mineral boost. Um, this little seaweed here is called dulles. Um, as you can see, dulles likes to piggyback on the back of other seaweeds. And it's actually piggybacking here on the back of a piece of kelp. As part of the experience, a meal is prepared. And the fish being cooked was bought at the foot of the Morns in Kilkeel Harbour, where nature has supplied some of its own foragers. This is all part of a month-long initiative looking at sustainable produce with a strictly family feel. Michelle Sherlow of Food NI explains. We want people to connect with sustainable food experiences. So we want to give them an opportunity to forage or to make chocolate or to look for seaweed or to take part in things like a sustainable banquet, um, to find sustainable recipes on local menus in Northern Ireland. When it comes to a family day out, what could replace a day on the beach and up close with nature? The links between culture, environment and food have always been there. It's events such as this that are passing that knowledge on to a new generation. The coastline may be rugged and sometimes wild, but on days like this, they are always memorable. Doogie BD, GB News, Kilkeel. Thanks for that, Doogie. Tom, it's a strange thing, isn't it, the, the extent to which we've become, in this country, disconnected from, from food mm. in, a, in a fundamental sense. We shop for it, and it yeah. comes wrapped up in cling film and, and all the rest, but... That, that culture which still persists elsewhere in the world of, of foraging and collecting the wild provender. Sure, yeah. We've, we've broken the connection, haven't we? To, a, to an extent. I mean, I do think there's a paradox, actually, um, Neil, because if, you know, if you go to most mass supermarkets or indeed even these more specialist shops, I mean, arguably compared to our childhoods, there's more organic food, so-called good you know, mm. food that's really good for you. Um, but, of course, alongside that, 
with lifestyles, we've seen the uptick in processed food and ready meal food. And we know, again, that that's not particularly healthy for you if you rely on that kind of food. I mean, why this whole cost of living crisis is so acute will be for some families. They don't have either the time or the money to go out and buy many of these uh, so-called organic uh, ingredients anyway. Uh, they, they rely on that sort of processed uh, food. So I think it's a, it is a mixed bag. Uh, I mean, I thought for a minute, you know, you were going to go on and say, uh, should we be eating insects as well? So, we, you know, because we've had krill, we've had mm. uh, seaweed, <laughs> you know, what point do we start eating insects? I mean, I, you know, I, I think the key to a healthy life is, 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 is exercise and a balanced diet. I think the challenge for people increasingly is, can they afford it? Well, Taylor, that, as Tom says, the piece about krill, insofar as clearly there are real health benefits that are there in eating, you know, you know, from the natural world, un unprocessed, whole food, uh, and then that piece about f foraging. We, we do have a, a slightly dislocated relationship with food, don't we? That we're dependent upon the well, supermarket. For me, Neil, this is linked to the issue of healthy eating. Mm. There's still no cure for dementia. One in three people will get dementia. We were talking about the length of life earlier in the show. The quality of life is also important. Mm. And so there is some evidence to indicate that, for example, more oily fish will put back the chances of getting mm. dementia. And much more research needs to be put into that. And I've asked some parliamentary questions about that because there is no cure for dementia. Mm -hmm. One in three. There are three of us here. I'm not suggesting either of us, any of us will get dementia, mm -hmm. but that's terrible. One in three people? And there's no cure? Say for modern cancers, though, one in two of us actually will get some form of cancer uh, in our lifetimes. So, and, and some of those cancers are linked to uh, these factors like... But more and more, ocean. more and more, isn't it? The evidence seems to be, you know, stacking up that a, a diet that's, that's, you know, cooked from scratch, you know, you know mm. food that's not processed, that's not full of salt, that's not full of sugar, is absolutely the way to go. I, I hear over and over again this talk of inflammation, mm. you know, mm. that, that seems to be part of ageing. And it's about educating people, you know, mm. at school level about yes. all this. Mm. Br bringing people back together with food and where it comes from. Yeah. It's a social thing, isn't it, really? It is. Mm. Yeah. It is. Moving on, moving on. In 2003, archaeologists excavating inside a cave on a remote Indonesian island found the remains of a previously unknown species of human being. The partial skeleton and skull belonged to a female, but what amazed the archaeologists was her diminutive size. In life, she would have stood less than four feet high, and when the story reached the world's media, her kind were promptly nicknamed hobbits, in honour of J.R.R. Tolkien's little heroes in the book of the same name. Now, 20 years later, the story has taken an unexpected turn, which claims that rather than having died out thousands of years ago, those ancient relatives of ours, properly called Homo floresiensis, may still be living in remote mountains in eastern Indonesia. Gregory Forth, who's an emeritus professor of anthropology at the University of Alberta, joins me now to cast more light on this, well, frankly, astonishing story. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Neil, is it? It is Neil. It is. I am Neil. Uh, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic story, this. Uh, talk, us, talk us through the initial discovery. You know, what or who were the, the, the Homo floresiensis? Where do they fit in the story of, of the human animal? Yeah, um, well, like many um, such things, it, it was found fortuitously by, by accident. Uh, I, I wasn't a, a member of, of the paleontological team that um, that, that came across it, but uh, for a number of years, uh, a, a team of uh, mostly Australian and uh, Indonesian um, researchers were... were uh, 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 looking for uh, evidence of um, uh, of humans, human remains that might be linked with the first uh, peopling of of, of Australia, um, and uh, it's, it's not clear exactly what they're expecting to find. But 
um, something like a latter day Homo erectus, I, I think, because they were uh, uh, very much going by the fact that uh, earlier, in, first in the 1950s and 60s, as a matter of fact, uh, evidence for some kind of uh, hominin. Uh, uh, population of Flores was found in, in the central part of the island um, in association with um, Stegodon, uh, ancient elephant uh, bones, and even um, stone uh, uh, a stone, um, I won't say stone tools, but but what may have been uh, stone tools, which uh, um, suggested that something had been hunting these things. Much too early uh, were the dates for Homo sapiens, so it was sort of assumed that uh, something like uh, Homo erectus was uh, around at that time on Flores, which, which in itself was quite a, a remarkable idea. Anyway, they were looking for the descendants of these uh, supposedly early uh, stegodon hunters, and uh, what should they find but uh, this creature that looked more like an australopithecine? In other words, it was uh, physically very primitive. Um, the, the largest specimen, the type specimen, stood uh, just over uh, three feet high, uh, just over a, a meter, uh, and had a, a remarkably small uh, cranial capacity. Capacity, in other words, a very small brain, about the size of a chimpanzee's. Um, so, yeah, after uh, much uh, further research, uh, analysis, and so on, it, it was uh, discussed. It was decided that this should be deemed an entirely new species, and it came to be called uh, Homo floresiensis. Um, there were suggestions that it shouldn't be included in in the Homo. Uh, with with people like ourselves because of the the facts as I've mentioned, but uh, um, that that eventually that the Homo designation eventually uh, won out, and and it is now twenty years later, and yeah, for a long time it's been um, accepted that it is indeed a new species, not a deformed uh, human dwarf or, or some such. Now, when when uh, what what span of time is Floresiensis supposed to have occupied, and and when? Was it thought that they had died out? Yeah. Um, well, I'd say, first of all, so far, uh, the remains of Floresiensis have been discovered at only one site, a sing single site in, in western uh, uh, Flores. Um, the dates for that site, initially they were uh, determined to be um, very recent, uh, even as recent as 12,000 years ago. The type specimen, the most complete, uh, was was pegged at 80, 18, 8,000 years. But then uh, you had other remains of the same type going back to about, about 90,000 years, uh, I, I think. Um, the, uh, later on, for various reasons, uh, there was uh, um, a geological reanalysis uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 the the setting in which uh, um, the the um, uh, Floresiensis remains were found, and and uh, they, they were redated to fifty or sixty thousand uh, years ago. Um, now that's uh, that that puts it back a bit, but it's still um, extremely recent geologically uh, speaking, and uh, it's at a time, of course, when when physically modern. Uh, Humans like ourselves would have uh, been present in, in various parts of the uh, planet, but I will emphasize um, that this is a single site. We only have dates for that site, so when it uh, became extinct, or indeed, dare I say, even if it became extinct, uh, it is is unknown. You say they're tantalizingly even if it became extinct. To bring the story more properly up to date, then. For what reason is it being speculated that Floresiensis may still be among us? Among us, um, or at least on Flores Island. Um, I began looking into local reports of uh, figures very similar to the reconstructions of uh, Homo Floresiensis uh, way back when. In fact, when I first started research on uh, uh, on Flores Island in the early 80s, um, I, um, I, I started researching, I moved from where I initially was to another location uh, in the Leo uh, ethno-linguistic area towards the eastern end of the island, and there I, I started hearing about uh, this sort of thing again, but uh, in this case they were reckoned to be uh, still, uh, still surviving, uh, still living, although... Uh, though very rare. Um, 
it was in the following year. Are they in a landscape? Uh, year after 203, sorry. Are they in a landscape that would lend itself credibly to the, to the, uh, to the existence still to this day of a, 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 a population? That said, to all um, intents and purposes, invisible. I mean, yeah. is, it, is it that kind of place? Sorry, that, you, that it... you, yeah, you, you keep cutting out, but I think I got the gist of your question. Uh, the Lea region is one of the most mountainous parts of Flores. Um, there's lots of highland flor uh, forest. Um, uh, switching back to Floresiensis for a moment, um, the, the, the discovery of the remains, um, it, it seems it was primarily a plant eater. Uh, so, yeah, lots of food uh, there would be still um, up in those highland uh, forests. So, so that's, that's, one, uh, that's one, one clue. Um, what I do in the book, sorry, am I just, interrupting you? Me, are are you with, cutting out a bit? Bear with me, Professor. I'll just, I'll just involve my, my, my panel guests here in the studio. Uh, Lord Taylor, that's quite a thought, isn't it, that after all this time of thinking we were alone on planet Earth... <laughs> that there could be a distant relative uh, still going about its business well, in a distant part of the Earth. Neil, it's exciting to think that these so-called hobbits may still exist. My concern is, though, could modern man be bringing his own problems to these people who might be leading very happy lives and we bring with them cancer, COVID? Mm. But can I just say, if they're still alive, could the professor mention two words Aston Villa to them because we need all the support we could get. It's just a request. <laughs> I'll bear it in mind. Mm. Tom, it's fascinating, I would say, isn't it, that we seem as a species to enjoy just the possibility that there are others among us. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, abominable snowman. Absolutely. Loch Ness monster. We seem to enjoy it. Whether there's mm. truth, and I'm not, I'm open-minded to the continuation of Floresiensis, but... We seem to need these shadows, don't we? Yeah, we do. And what I found absolutely extraordinary about what the professor told us there was the fact that um, 12,000 years ago, I think, was the figure he mentioned, which, you know, if you think about uh, as a human species, we uh, discovered farming uh, 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just wonder to what extent there's a connection between what is broadly seen as a period in our evolution when we were hunter-gatherers, we weren't particularly as social. I mean, that's the point about Neanderthals, isn't it? It's potentially why they died out and why we replaced them. Is there something about the invention of farming, therefore, that actually led to potentially, certainly, the partial extinction? It's a story that must go on. Mm. We've run out of time. The Professor Gregory Forth, that's a fantastic, fantastic mm. thought to end on. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I, will, I will speculate about that long into the night. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, that's all from me on Neil Oliver Live this evening. My thanks as always to my panel, Lord Taylor of Warwick. Thank you for being with us, Lord thank Taylor. You. And Tom Buick, writer and education specialist. Thank you. All my guests this evening, what a, what a mixture, what, a, what an array of topics. I find it stimulating every time. I'll be back at six o'clock next Saturday. Uh, next up, it's Ministry of Offence. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity.